uh, I'm sure all of you all must be hypoglycemic as I am. So I, let, let's keep it very short and as interactive as possible so, so that, that um, it gets interesting for you all and you all don't doze off during the session. So uh, as uh, Dr. Rajkiran sir has rightly pointed out, most of the rheumatologic emergencies have actually been discussed in some of the other session here. In fact, uh, when Dr. Srinivas sir had uh, uh, given those snippets, fever with splenomegaly, fever with uh, rash, fever with uh, altered sensorium, in every, in every uh, clinical scenario, a rheumatologic emergency is a possibility. So there is, there is every possible manifestation can happen in a rheumatologic condition. So suspecting it is very important, but at the same time, over-diagnosing it would actually lead to uh, dismal consequences to the patient. So having said that, a uh, question to all of you all. So what are the common rheumatologic emergencies that you all have seen in, your, in, the, in the critical care? SLE flare, SLE flare catastrophic APS, anything else? Something that I keep getting reference for time and again, vasculitis, yeah, so main, mainly alveolar hemorrhages because I, lot of referrals come for that. And uh, the most common referral that I get is ANA is positive, patient admitted with fever, ANA is positive. So uh, how many patients actually who come to the ER get, get to the ICU? So with certain uh, previous studies that have been done. Out of 100 patients who visit the ER with rheumatologic problems, at least 30 would require hospitalization and 10 of them would require intensive care. Mind you, these are patients who come to the ER. These are not patients who come to the outpatient because uh, overall rheumatologic emergencies are a little rare in the branch of rheumatology itself. So what are the common reasons for admission? As mentioned, flare of rheumatic disease. It could be the first or a new manifestation of an existing rheumatic disease. Because we are immunosuppressing the patients, patients could have infections as a complication, adverse effects of the drugs that we use, and certain other serious illnesses which are related to any other speciality in a patient who has a prior rheumatic disease. So these are the usual reasons why a patient would come to uh, the ER for an emergency. And uh, unfortunately, rheumatologic emergencies take a lot of time to diagnose. Our tests don't come very fast. Certain times we, we are in a dilemma whether we are treating a rheumatologic condition or some other condition, another infection. Even in a known rheumatologic case, we are not sure whether it's a disease flare or whether there is an associated infection. So certain times what happens is even as rheumatologists, we are not very sure what we are, what conclusion we should give for a particular case. So mortality rates are usually very high and certain times even if you are able to find out what it is the disease may not actually respond to the available therapies. So mortality rates have been reported to be as high as 50% for rheumatologic emergencies. And the most common organs that are involved in rheumatologic emergencies are respiratory system number one, followed by renal, followed by gastrointestinal and nervous system. So uh, rheumatologic emergencies can be true rheumatologic emergencies, like you have diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, lupus pneumonitis, myocarditis and lupus catastrophic APS, vasculitis, scleroderma renal crisis, they are very specific for rheumatology as such. Then there could be emergencies which can happen in rheumatologic conditions but can happen in other specialities also like interstitial lung disease with respiratory failure, pulmonary embolism in a patient with, with the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, cardiac tamponade, acute renal failure. So there are multiple emergencies that can happen. Now here we are going to discuss a few cases which are actually which have which have been admitted in Yashoda ICU itself. I have modified a few of them. I mean I modified a little clinical detail so that this case itself becomes a little simpler. While the original case is actually more complicated than what I am actually showing here. So let's start with this. There is a 24 year old lady uh, who has presented with fever of 101 to 103 degree Fahrenheit uh, grade of 15 days duration and has rashes over both the lower limbs like this and has worsening breathlessness, cough, mild hemoptysis and an examination has pallor, pedal edema, hypotension and a saturation of 90% on room air and the auscultation shows diffuse crepitations in the lung fields. There is another positive finding that we found that was that uh, patient has some nail fold infarcts again suggestive of some ischemia. So what is the probable diagnosis here? 
Okay. So, it is vasculitis because you are having a vasculitic rash, you have some ischemic manifestations, fine. Um, so, on investigations, patient was found to have mild anemia, leukocytosis, platelet count of 80,000, creatinine of 1.4 milligram per deciliter with urine showing proteinuria with active sediments, there is mild transaminitis and the x-ray shows something like this. Any other investigation that you all would like to know or have? Anti-GBM antibodies, okay. Anything else? C and K, P and K, skin biopsy, okay. Uh, any other clinical finding that you would like to know? Hemoptysis is there, mild hemoptysis is there, blood streaks sputum. So, I will tell you that ANA is positive I'll, uh, and what is your diagnosis here? So, I have written that there is SLE based on patient is a female patient with presenting to you with vasculitic rashes, proteinuria with active sediments and a probable alveolar hemorrhage. Okay. Now, I have missed certain clinical details in this case and I will just add on those. So, here is the same lady, same findings. Additionally, there is a systolic murmur noted at the apex. Fine. So, this patient had presented with fever, blood cultures were sent. Two days later, this blood culture comes out to be MSSA positive. It was infective endocarditis and on antibiotics, this patient's fever had resolved. The entire diagnosis of lupus in this patient were ba was based on one, the, the misleading uh, manifestations were one, the purpuric rash and two, the ANA that was positive. Now, so not all vasculitic rashes are autoimmune in nature. There are multiple causes where vasculitic rashes can happen because of other reasons like infections, one of them being infective endocarditis, all the tropical fever syndromes can cause a vasculitic rash. Malignancies like leukemias and lymphomas can present with a vasculitic rash. Drugs, toxins can like sympathomimetics, cocaine can present with vasculitic rash and inherited connective tissue diseases can also have purpuric rashes. So, having a purpuric rash is not equal to having an autoimmune disease. Having an ANA positivity is also not equal to having an autoimmune disease. So, this was seemed a little simple, but the actual case was not so simple. Now, here we had a 24 year old who presented with lupus for 2 years. Who, who had lupus for 2 years, initial manifestation being predominantly arthritis, was prescribed methotrexate, defaulted therapy, came back with nephritis, was prescribed steroids and mycophenolate, defaulted mycophenolate because of the cost, continued only 20 milligram of prednisolone, 2 months later comes with these same symptoms of high grade fever, uh, worsening breathlessness, hypotension, purpuric rashes, nail fold infarcts, systolic murmur. And the 2D echo showed vegetations in the mitral valve with LV dysfunction. Now, somebody told Libman Sachs endocarditis as I was talking about the systolic murmur. So, here we also were in a dilemma whether this was Libman Sachs endocarditis or was this infective endocarditis. If it was Libman Sachs endocarditis and patient is having an LV dysfunction and is in hypotension and with tachycardia, patient is probably having a myocarditis. And in that situation, giving pulse steroids becomes very, very important. So, we were not sure whether we were actually treating with an infection or uh, uh, whether patient has an active lupus here. And let me tell you, none of the investigations, none of the investigations like CRP, procalcitonin will be able to tell you whether you are dealing with an infection, especially when the patient has both a disease flare and an infection. Yes. It was a non-palpable purpura, sir. Yeah, but most of the times what happens is the moment you see purpuric crash, they, they will think it's a vasculitic crash. Certain times what happens sir, like if the rash is like 3-4 days older, it may not have that classic uh, palpable uh, uh, manifestation also. So, here we were very confused in this case. So, we had to wait for 2 days and the cultures had come positive and this was a patient who had infective endocarditis and had improved with antibiotics. 
So certain it so the most important thing that you should understand is it is so very hard at times to find out whether we are dealing with an infection or a disease flare. Even for a rheumatologist, it is very difficult. And uh, so if you tell me like, should we give pulse steroids? Should we give pulse steroids? And call me again and again and ask. Even I won't be able to tell you till some concrete evidence comes up. It should be uh, progression. Certain times what happens is in this whole process of understanding what exactly is happening, the patient may actually deteriorate also. Then coming to uh, the second case. So this is a 26 year old male, fever of 7 days duration, cough, breathlessness, hemoptysis and, and uh, with presented with hemoptysis, has hypotension, hypoxia and on examination was found to have icterus, hypotension and diffuse crepitations in the lungs. So let me clear it here, there are no other positive findings on examination, okay. Investigations showed mild anemia, mild thrombocytopenia, mild erase creatinine with uh, proteinuria and pyuria, uh, their protein loss of 1.42 uh, grams with transaminitis, a bilirubin of 3.6. He had coagulopathy with both PTNR and APTT raised. And ANCA was done for this patient, obviously, right? Young male, fever, cough, breathlessness, hemoptysis. And the ANCA showed a perinuclear pattern. Chest X-ray showed an ARDS pattern and rest of the investigations did not show any major abnormality. Now, what is the diagnosis here? You can tell me whatever it is, even if it is wrong because what is the diagnosis here? Okay. Uh, somebody told Chuck Strauss. Anything else? Fine. So, to look at, it looks like a vasculitis, isn't it? So, again, this referral uh, comes to us with an diagnosis of ANCA vasculitis with diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, nephritis. Should we give pulse steroid? Should we start plasma exchange? And I am like, there are certain odd points in this case which do not fit in for a ANCA associated vasculitis. What are they? We have repeated the hemoglobin over 24 hours for somebody who is having so much of hemoptysis with so much infiltrates in the lung, the HB is not dropping, it is the same. There is icterus, liver function abnormalities in a patient with ANCA associated vasculitis is rare oh, and even if it is an abnormality, it is usually transaminitis, not hyperbilirubinemia. Hypotension is rare in ANCA associated vasculitis unless patient has a florid alveolar hemorrhage because once there is a renal involvement, you usually expect hypertension. Again, when I say perinuclear pattern of ANCA, it has been done by a method called indirect immunofluorescence which is not a, a very specific method to diagnose ANCA. It is a sensitive method to pick up uh, ANCA but ideally it should be confirmed by ELISA. And then coagulopathy, all ANCA associated vasculitis are usually associated with thrombophilic state, not with a coagulopathic state unless and until there is extensive endothelial damage. So I, what I have advised is wait for the ANCA ELISA reports that is anti-PR3, anti-MPO reports. It, I have mentioned that ictris is very uncommon, DH is unlikely because the HB was not dropping. So I have uh, suggested that to treat this as a tropical fever because a short duration illness, multi-organ dysfunction. So treat this as a tropical fever and treatment was continued as tropical fever more in favor of leptospirosis or rickettsial infection though the serologies have not come positive. Now there have been discussions among all the consultants as to what exactly is the diagnosis, why I am so keen about not giving steroids in this patient, sir would know this case. And then patient at patient attenders. Patient attenders know that there is a test that has come positive which is ANCA. Rest, rest, there is no clue on what is the cause of fever. So obviously what would the patient attenders think that there is a, uh, there is a test that is positive but they are holding treatment saying that there is an infection. So it is so difficult to consult these patients saying that you know we will have to wait for the reports because this could be a false positive ANCA. And the next day the creatinine had increased to 2.2. Again the same pressure, should we pulse this patient because the creatinine is worsening. Two days later, the hemoglobin remains stable, bilirubin, the transaminitis is improving, the bilirubin is stable and then the ANCA ELISA reports come which is antiproteinase 3 and antimyeloperoxidase ELISA which are negative and the creatinine is normalizing, coagulopathy has improved. 
So, it is very important to understand the relevance of an immunological test. The very fact that most immunological tests can have a lot of false positives, can be positive in healthy population, can become positive in infections, can become positive because of drugs is something that everybody has to understand. So, the significance of a serologic test like ANA or ANCA coming positive also has to be correlated with the clinical condition. If there are odd points, just hold. It may not actually be a primary rheumatologic condition, it could be something else. So, on this line, I would also like to talk about ANA because this is one test that this is the most common referral that we all get. Now, anti-nuclear antibody is done by three methods. Anti-nuclear antibody can be done by ELISA where in the well of the ELISA certain antigens, nuclear antigens are coated, the patient serum is added and then you look for presence of anti-nuclear antibody. The second method is indirect immunofluorescence where on a slight cells are put with very high nucleus to cytoplasmic ratio. So, all the nuclear antigens are there on the slide, patient serum is added and then you look for anti-nuclear antibody. The third method is immunoblot where you have a set of antigens against which a western blot is done and you look for antibodies in that particular test. So, if you look at all of these, which test would be more sensitive to pick up ANA? The ELISA where you have some antigens coated on the well or the cell where all the nuclear antigens are there or an immunoblot where only a specific antigens are tested for. So, which is which will be more sensitive in picking up ANA? Immunofluorescence. So, very obviously it will be immunofluorescence because you are putting a cell there. So, immunofluorescence is the best screening method. There is no second question on that. And unfortunately, another very important thing is that yes, no problem. Unfortunately, another very important thing is that that uh, all these tests have a like ELISA, immunoblot or IF can have a lot of false positives number one. And if you screen a healthy population of 100 members, you would notice that 15 of them can be positive for ANA without any connective tissue disease. So, you can have ANA positivity in healthy individuals, you can have ANA that is false positive. So, how do we decide whether that particular ANA is significant or not? It completely depends on the clinical presentation of the patient. So, false positives are not uncommon and whenever somebody tells me ANA is positive, the first thing I ask is which method have you done? If they say that is indirect immunofluorescence, I always ask them what is the pattern, what is the titer because if you are getting lower titers, if you are getting a pattern that is so very uncommon like you get 1 in 100, 1 plus nucleoli, it is 99.99 percent false positive. So, so these are, the, so the pattern and the titer is, is the most important thing which will give us a clue to the diagnosis. And most important thing that you have to remember is not every ANA positive pay, uh, investigation is equal to an autoimmune disease. Now, the third case, a 54 year old male who presented with two weak symptoms of progressive breathlessness and cough, ANA was done uh, and it was negative, patient had leukocytosis on the investigations, no other positive findings. So, any clues on what is the diagnosis? Predominant neutrophilic leukocytosis. So, there, is, there are a lot of GGOs consolidations noted in the CT, right? So, a very common investigation that is being sent nowadays. Patient has a rapidly progressive pulmonary failure that is what that much is uh, that that much alone you can conclude from this. So, they have done a myositis profile which has come 3 days later and it has shown an anti-MDA5 antibody that was very strongly positive, okay? So, the diagnosis now is? So, it is an anti-MDA5 associated rapidly progressive ILD which is a more recently described rheumatologic condition. So, one thing that was not looked at is this patient had a lot of palmar papules and some palmar rashes. Now, this is something that can give us a clue that this patient has an anti-MDA5 associated disease. Now, anti-MDA5 associated disease has very high mortality rates ranging up to 80 percent even with treatment and this patient was given pulse steroids, was given cyclophosphamide and tacrolimus, plasma exchange was also planned and one cycle was given. But this patient had progressive respiratory failure and we lost this patient. 
So what happens is uh, in this patient I would really say even if you would have done, a done many things we could probably not have saved this patient. But what you should understand is if a patient is having a rapidly progressive respiratory failure, it is not always an atypical pneumonia or an alveolar hemorrhage, it could also be a rapidly progressive ILD and in such situations myositis profile would be required. Having said that doing myositis profile for every patient who presents with uh, atypical pneumonia which is getting easily controlled with the drugs that you are with the antibiotics that you are giving them, please do not do a myositis profile because myositis profile is an investigation that has been there only for few years and there are a lot of false positives it, uh, in, in a myositis profile and we ourselves don't know which of these is false positive and which is a truly positive myositis profile. So in anti-MDFI associated ILD, cutaneous ulcers, palmar papules in a rapidly progressive lung disease should hint that this is an anti-MDFI associated ILD. So these are the three cases. This is another small case that I would tell. So there was a 32 year old lady who had presented with perforation peritonitis to the ER. Surgery was done and post surgery the resection sample had shown vasculitis. Patient also had acute kidney injury which was attributed to the multi-organ dysfunction that she was having but she did have a lot of active sediments in the urine also. And then uh, once the vasculitis has come up, ANA was sent which had come really strongly positive. It was 3 plus homogeneous, 1 in 320 titer. One thing that we found that when we examined the patient, this patient already had a discoid rash. Patient had fever for 2 months which was low grade on and off, was having a lot of weight loss. And uh, she attributed the rash to allergy to some um, uh, product that she had used. So, the one important thing that everybody has been stressing since morning and I should also tell you is that history and examination are the most important thing. And especially in rheumatology, more than 70% of the cases can be diagnosed solely based on history and examination and serology investigations need not be done so frequently. This patient had a 3 month hospital stay, luckily she had improved and currently she is doing fine. So whenever a patient, whenever a patient comes to us with a rheumatologic emergency or you don't even know it's a rheumatologic emergency, patient comes to the emergency, the first thing that you will have to do is you will basically have to evaluate which organs are involved and based on the organ involvement we will be able to at least come to a clue whether this is a primary rheumatologic flare or there is an associated infection. And if a patient is already on immunosuppressive therapy that is pretty strong and patient had responded in the past but now comes with fever, it is more likely that it could be an infection rather than a flare of the disease. Uh, unfortunately what happens is there is always an overlap, patient has a high disease activity, is on significant amount of immunosuppression, then they develop a super added infection. Now managing these kind of patients becomes very difficult because if you increase the immunosuppression the infection would worsen, if you decrease the immunosuppression the disease could kill the patient. So it is basically a double edged sword and sometimes it is very very difficult to take a call in these patients. And uh, only appropriate autoantibodies need to be sent because uh, we have noticed a lot of times that when a patient comes say, says polyarthralgias along with fever, now polyarthralgias can be a part of infection also. But then there will be a list of investigations, ANA, rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP, HLA, B27, ANCA in a row. So there is no point in doing connective tissue di disease profiles. You have to do whatever is relevant. If a patient is coming with fever of short duration, is having polyarthralgias, there is no synovitis on examination, you do not have to send rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP. So, uh, and uh, certain times whenever there is an acute exacerbation, a few laboratory tests may help. Most of the times when we know that it is a rheumatologic flare, the treatment is very easy, giving pulse steroids or putting the patient, patient on plasma exchange or giving IVAG. But coming to a diagnosis whether the patient has a rheumatologic flare or some other etiology is the most important thing. Thank you.